Jeans. <laughs>
<laughs> Get Susie for fuck's sake! Get out! <laughs> That's your stuff, Becky. Get by it now. Go on, Susie, get it, do you?
Susie Bob. Get hands in here, get hands.
tranquilo.
secret place where the sound of the crowd is so far away. And you take my hand, and it feels like home. We both understand it's where we belong. So, how do I say? Do I say goodbye? Both have our dreams, we both wanna fly. So let's take tonight to carry us through the lonely times. I'll always look back as I walk away. Hiya! <laughs> 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 
Ah, you just woke them up. Oh, oh, oh. Funny dress. You're not, you're not peeking. Tata. That door exists. At the other side. Gasty. Gasty Madison. Kirsty going to work. <laughs> Look at that face.
You like the sea, Kirsty? In a way, lighthouses are anachronisms. Today, biotech companies are attempting to patent the very stuff of life. Yet when the most enduring design of lighthouse was created, their inventors deliberately refused to patent it in the hope that it would save lives all over the world. As the last lighthouse keepers in Britain lose their jobs next month, it's worth recalling an old morality. Well, my lighthouse career came to an end in uh, 91 when the Canaire was automated. The museum at that time was being spoken about. And then finally got underway and I got made assistant manager to, to it. It was uh, an act of parliament of 1786 that called for the code for the purposes of navigation. And the first lighthouse was sighted here at Canary. Thomas Smith, the lamp maker in Leith, invented a parabolic reflector lined with mirrors. And that was the first light that was installed here at Canary Head. Robert Stevenson was a son-in-law of Thomas Smith and five generations following then of the Stevensons became lighthouse engineers and it is through their invention and ingenuity that we owe all that is more or less in lighthouse building throughout the world today. The only exception to the rule was Robert Louis Stevenson and of course he became the, the famous poet. During their reign as engineers, I suppose the family could have uh, made a fortune out of uh, everything that they had invented, but it was uh, ultimately to uh, save and preserve life that the, the whole thing was done. In today's world, you wouldn't get nobody giving away knowledge or, or invention uh, the way that these people did. Everything now is all what you can sell it for and what you can get. Service to produce these things that was done without thought of a financial gain. It was done for the benefit of the people that was being served. In that way, I suppose we've, we've lost something.
still work, is it? that that lighthouse there is still operational. And apparently there's 67 lighthouses in Scotland. They're all controlled by computer system based in Edinburgh. It's where the sort of grandfather used to work. It's now decommissioned, of course.
going, don't sit there. Doing raffles. Go on, Kirsty, bounce. Granny's had six glasses of wine.
a long time ago, deep in the deepest parts of Germany, two sausage munchers comfortably held the record for the world's strongest beer. And they were quite pleased with themselves. For coming out to Deutschland, but for having the strength to be here to Welt. This is my father in Germany. Bernard. Bernard, making very good beer. Santa Claus, with beer. This is so tall. Das. Klugwisch. Wunderbar. Sehr gut, danke. But then the jolly fellows at Brewdogs. It's us. <laughs> stunned the sausage munchers with a 32% beer known as Tactical Nuclear Penguin. We've got it going on up here. And. <laughs> causing those pesky but efficient Germans to throw all their toys out of the pram. This beer of Schottland. Das ist nicht witzig. Ein klein Kind über Kopf mit ein Würstchenslagen. Das ist witzig. Das ist witzig. Ein Gans. Mit a Fußpumpe aufblasen und als Gegenplatte benutzen, um Deutschland, Deutschland über alles zu spielen. <laughs> <laughs> das ist sehr witzig. Das ist witzig. But this beer from Scotland? No. Nicht witzig. Nein. Unable to cope with the success of the penguin, the sausage munchers developed a dastardly plan. Wir haben unseren Dudog versteckt. We have a plan for Verdun das Pinguin, Turton, for Turton das Pinguine, Pinguine, bye bye Pinguine. Their insidious plot was captured on film by Brewdog security cameras. With the penguin out of the way, Hans and Wolfgang brought the title of World's Strongest Beer back to the fatherland. But the intrepid boys at Brewdog knew exactly what they had to do march into battle and avenge the penguin. With a dog in a hat and a little boat, we are going up against the might of the German Navy. Bismarck, bearing 15 degrees. 15 degrees to port. Launch the penguin. <laughs> Our boys learned quickly that firing small flightless birds at the massive German battleship was completely ineffective. So they got to work on a secret weapon of their own that would send those sausage munchers back to Der Schwarzwald where they belong. After five months in the making, we finally have a tiny amount of our 41% IPA. Happy birthday, Wolfgang! Woohoo! Sink the Bismarck is the world's strongest beer at 41%. On the notes, this beer is mega intense. It's got all the big American pop flavors in there, and they are huge. This is just an amazing experience in your palate. There's so, so much bitterness there. It punishes you. There's a sweetness from the malt and the alcohol, and there's just an avalanche of hops coming at you as well. Wolfgang is not going to like this. He'll bloody do it. I have failed you, Father Bernard. You look a bit like an elf. So, you may have noticed there wasn't actually much brewing in this episode. There wasn't any brewing at all. Well, that's because unlike Georg at Scherstau, we like to keep some of our secrets here. <laughs> what? Georg. <laughs> A Scottish microbrewery has caused an outcry among health campaigners with the launch of Britain's strongest beer. Tokyo beer from the brewery Brew Dog is marketed as an intergalactic fantastic oak aged stout. But what actually makes it really, really unique is that it's 12% alcohol stronger than most wines. Well, joining me now from Aberdeen is the founder of Brew Dog, James Watt. Mr. Watt, can I quote to you the, uh, what the chairman of the Scottish Health Action on Alcohol Board has said? This beer is the last thing we need. It's absolutely wrong to be going with this. Um, yes, I think they're acting a little bit like a bull in a, a china shop. They seem to have no understanding of the industry which they're trying to police. And um, what they have to understand is this is not a beer that's going to be on sale in supermarkets. It's not going to be on sale in corner shops. The only place that someone in Scotland can buy this beer in our, is on our website. So it's a product that's made very much for connoisseurs, people who seek out these kind of things. So well, he, I just he might, think they... He might not understand your industry, perhaps, but he does understand the general climate, which is there is general concern UK-wide about high-strength beers and the damage it's doing to society. Don't you feel any kind of responsibility? 
Yes, yeah, certainly, and I agree with their aims and I agree with what they're trying to do, but I think they're kind of targeting the wrong people here for the price. I mean, Tokyo is expensive, it's £4 a bottle. So for the price of two bottles of Tokyo, you can go into a supermarket and with some of the offers they've got on, you can buy up to 24 tins of some kind of cheap cheap alternative. And I think if someone's going to abuse alcohol, that's the kind of thing they're going to seek out as opposed to a niche connoisseur's product. But a few stats for you. Alcohol-related death in Scotland doubled in the last 15 years. Alcohol-related attendance in hospital up 15% in the last 10. Again, you are promoting a high-strength beer. That can't be a good thing at the moment. I mean, what we're promoting is a company we want to change people's perceptions about beer. We want to make them drink a lot less. I mean, our beer comes in small bottles. It all has a lot of taste and flavour. So we want to change people's perceptions about beer, make them enjoy beer with food and drink less beer, but drink better quality beer, beer that tastes of something. But your company's got form on this. You were criticised by your own industry group, the Portman Group, for some of the packaging on some of your beer. You called it, on the packaging, an aggressive beer. Yes, and, th and that was uh, referring to the taste of the beer. That was Punk IPA, which what, is a you, heavily hopped India you, Pale Ale. You can see a lot why of hops people in there, a lot of bitterness, a lot of bite. Um, well, I think a few of these issues are just the nanny state gone mad. I think at the end of the day, the consumer is going to make up their mind as to what they do and what, what, what they buy, what they drink, and what they don't drink. So, okay, Mr. Watt, thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you. Bye.
is a borough. It's a bluff that I mean. Used to be a lot of fishing boats. Bright blue and green. I used to be a factory. Dooley's was his name. But that's just history. Oh, what a shame. Praise the borough. Seen all those white horses in front of me. Raise a bar up. It's a rock that I need. Used to be a lot of fishing boats, black, blue, and green. I smell the smell. They're coming from me. It's coming from that good breath I act to me. Raise a bar Rock the landing, used to be a lot of fishing boats, black, blue, and green. And that white house, it's a shine of the sea, but that's been made abandoned, just like me. Raise the bar it's a rock the landing, used to be a lot of fishing boats, black, blue, and green. Raise up a rock, rock that I need. Used to be a lot of fishing boats, bright blue and green. Used to be a party, Dooley's was his name. But that's just history, oh what a shame. Raise up a rock, rock that I need. Used to be a lot of fishing boats, bright blue and green. That is the worst kite I've ever seen. Did you a good cheeky wee monkey? She stuck her tongue out. You're doing a great job, Jane. That is the best kite I think I've ever seen. <laughs>
It's the only kite I know that doesn't know how to fly. It's the best kite I've ever seen, I think. It's the only kite I know that needs flying lessons. <laughs> I think Kirsty's got a better chance of flying in that kite. Whoa! <laughs> yep, that was great, Kirsty. Hiya Scott! You not going for a wee run? That's it. What are you doing? I'm lying on the grass and masks in. Masks in. Up! Up! Ha <laughs> ya, daddy! You're looking at the kite. Oh, oh, bless you. Have you seen the kite?
caught anything? I just got shrimp. Got a shrimp? No, I mean a prawn. Prawn. yourself. Is it dead? Okay. Cut in, Lisa. Okay, I'll catch you. Cut in. So your boots are underwater again. Go under the waves, Scott. Yes. They're the big ones. We go under the waves, Kirsty. Yeah. We're gonna get our heads stoked. Do you see the big boats as well? Boats are rubbish. Boats are rubbish. <laughs> they are. They're just muckle things that carry fish, and you get rides on. You don't really get rides on them, but never mind. You do get fish in them all. Anyway, let's go under the big waves. Look, that's one. That's me. No, it's not. nearly, and that's a, that's a, a wave, Kirsty. Look, here's another wave. Oh! Oh! That's bad. <laughs> that was a bad wave, wasn't it? You should move that. <laughs> oh, you want to move, do you? <laughs> you should move up. When we, when we get a big wave, we're oh going to get a big God, wave. Behind us, that's bad. Behind us, it's a really bad wave. Right, Kirsty, it's going to hit us any minute. Oh, here comes one. Oh, that's... Yeah, the alarm's going off in the car. It's because there's, there's something around it. Here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> Just as well we're in here. Oh, here's a big one. Here's a big one. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh! 
<laughs> we are going to get it big time. Oh. It's good to hit us big time sometime. Okay, I believe you. <laughs> that is a big Whoa! Gee, <laughs> <Liz>. <laughs> I think I better move. I think you should move. Oh. I think you should move. You're like a wow, that's too often.
Edward the Confessor, King of England, promised the throne to William of Normandy on his death. After his death, when Harold of England failed to recognize the promise his brother-in-law had made, William prepared for war. The long ships sailed against England, and at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, William of Normandy defeated Harold of England. There were knights from the Seigneury of Fraiselières among the victorious Normans. The grateful conqueror granted them holdings in his new kingdom and soon they began to acquire lands further north. By 1109, they were established on the Scottish borders at Mead Path on the River Tweed, near Peebles and the seigneur of Fraiselières had become the Scottish Frasers. They spread further north. One branch, the Frasers of Philorth, settled on the northeast coast in Aberdeenshire. A wine vault, part of the original stronghold, still exists. This original castle Fraser, now a lighthouse, looks out over the grey North Sea to Norway, home of their pre-Norman ancestors. Since 1375, the seat of the Frasers of the North has been Cambalg Castle. Cambalg was acquired by the grandson of Tuch and Cowie, who fought for Robert the Bruce at Bannockburn and married Bruce's sister, the Lady Mary. The Scottish War of Independence established the Frasers in history. Their heroism and sacrifice brought them honor, noble rides, and rich lands. By 1618, Andrew Fraser of Muchel and Ma had completed Castle Fraser, one of the loveliest of Scottish castles. Between 1614 and 1620, he was awarded the chief arms of the family and afterwards was created Lord Fraser. The chief arms are now regarded as having devolved upon Lord Sultan of Philor. In the Highlands, in Inverness, Another great branch of the family had evolved its own pattern and become Clan Fraser of Lovett. This branch soon adopted the Gaelic custom of sending their children to be fostered by their tenantry. Their second language became Gaelic, and between chief and clan there grew up lasting bonds of affection and loyalty. Hugh Fraser of Lovett and Kinnell is generally regarded as the founder of the clan, but the great name is Simon who fought with William Wallace in the War of Independence and was barbarously executed by the English. In Gaelic, the clan chief is always Makhimi, the son of Simon. It was from the tar and plain of Lovett on the south shore of the Bewley Firth that the chief of the Inverness Sir Frasers took his name. His seat is Beaufort Castle, which stands on the site of Castle Downing the original fortress from which the clan slogan is derived. Castle Downey was burned by Hanoverian soldiers after the 45. Only a rockery now remains. Loch Ness drives a silver wedge through the Lovett lands, which include the Aird, Strathfara, and Strathglass, the valley of the stream. Here, the climate is kind, the soil fertile. Proud of its Norman heritage, the clan prospered. 
Matches were made with noble names that ensured the favor of the crown. Names like Weems, Lyon, Gordon, and Gray. But marriages nearer home in the Highlands could be difficult and dangerous. One such marriage led to the Battle of Blarnalaini, the Battle of the Shirts in 1544. At the eastern end of Loch Lochy, 300 traders and 500 men of Clan Ronald fell. The day was hot and both sides shed their belted blades to fight fiercely in their shirts. The survivors of the clan gathered beneath a yew tree which still stands in Strathetic. Afterwards, the story continues, 80 widows of the clan gave birth to sons and so the clan was reborn. Julia Priory was founded in 1230 and christened Beaulieu, the beautiful place, by the Norman monks. The tombstone of Makimi and his son, the master of Lovett, can be seen here. They both died in the Battle of the Shirts. The great chronicle of the Frasers is the Wardlaw Manuscript. This claims to give the history of the clan from 916 until 1674 and contains a description of the kind of gathering out of which eventually grew the familiar Highland Games. My Lord Lovett, to train his young kinsmen and clan with martial discipline, caused the countrymen to come into Inverness 50 or 60 at a time and were daily exercised upon the level of the castle hill. So that not only the young men of the name of Fraser, but many of the adjacent clans out of emulation flocked in, keeping set days of weekly exercise and the whole muster turned my Lord Lovett's train band. They used swimming, arching, football, throwing the bar, fencing, dancing, wrestling and such manly, sprightly exercises and recreations. Very fit for polishing and refining youth and to keep them from effeminacy, baseness, loitering and idleness. Although it is almost certain that its author, James Fraser, who survived until 1709, brought it up to a much later period, the Wardlaw manuscript breaks off abruptly in the year 1674. One wonders if the missing section makes mention of one of the most brilliant and bizarre figures in Scottish history. Simon Fraser, 11th Lord Lovett, who came to be known as the Old Fox. Born in the 1660s, he graduated in 1683 at Aberdeen University, intending to become a lawyer. Instead, he attached himself as secretary to his cousin, Makimi, and by devious means became himself the master of Lovett. His niece, however, rallying powerful support, was declared baroness of Lovett, an obstacle which Simon decided to overcome by marrying the girl's mother. At Castle Downey, having dragged out her maid, the lady was made close prisoner in her chamber. And with Mr. Robert Munro, minister of Avatar and four ruffians, about two or three in the morning, he proposes to the lady that she should marry him. And when she fell lamenting and crying, the great pipe was blown up to drown her cries and the wicked villain ordered the minister to proceed. The aforesaid ruffians rent off her clothes cutting her stays with their dirks and so thrust her into bed. As a result of this exploit, Simon was outlawed and he fled to France. He returned during the 1715 Rising, withdrew his clansmen from the Jacobite army, captured Inverness Castle from the rebels, and was rewarded by a royal pardon for his past crimes and given possession once more of his estate. The second Jacobite rising of 1745 found Lord Lovett a gouty old man, almost 80, adored by his clansmen, an incorrigible fisher in troubled waters. For a while he sat on the fence, trying to decide between the dull Hanoverian George and the dashing Charles Edward Stuart. The crushing government defeat at Preston Pans 
made up his mind for him and he declared himself for the Stuarts. A decision that led to the disastrous field of Culloden. Fraser casualties were heavy. Their Lieutenant Colonel, Charles Fraser, younger of Invalarche, lying severely wounded, was shot in cold blood by order of Butcher Cumberland, commander of the government forces. A young staff officer named Wolfe had refused to act as executioner. On the evening following the shattering defeat of Culloden, Lord Lovett met Prince Charles for the first time at Gorthlick House. Both were now hunted fugitives, their cause in ruins. Lovett is said to have evaded capture by disguising himself as a woman. Then his faithful clansman carried the old man in a litter over some of the highest mountains in Scotland to his island refuge in Loch Mora. Here he was finally discovered, hiding in a tree trunk, clutching a private hoard of 6,000 guineas, his gouty legs wrapped in flannel. Like his great ancestor Simon, he was tried in London on a charge of treason. The trial took place in Westminster Hall before his fellow peers. He conducted his own defence with great dignity and courage, but was condemned to death. As his coach rumbled along to the scaffold, a cockney hag thrust her head through the window and cried, You're going to have your head chopped off, you ugly old Scotch dog. Heaving himself up, Simon replied smilingly, I verily believe I shall, you ugly old English bitch. On the 9th of April, 1747, he mounted the scaffold on Tower Hill, tested the edge of the axe with his thumb, tipped the headsman ten guineas, and warned the man that he'd be very angry if the job was botched. He put his head on the block and quoted the Latin tag, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is meet and fitting to die for one's country. Then, as a signal, he dropped his handkerchief. He was the last man to be beheaded in England. After Culloden, the supporters of Prince Charles paid heavily for their loyalty. Those who survived bore the full brunt of the English redcoat savagery. Twenty prisoners died, some by the axe, others by hanging. Over a thousand were deported. The fate of another 700 remains unknown. 1745 ended a way of life. Even the traditional Highland dress was forbidden. And it was not until 1782, with the help of Archibald Fraser, MP for Inverness, that it was restored. The Fraser Tartan is first depicted in a portrait of Major James Fraser of Castle Leathers, painted in 1723. When the Prime Minister of the time, Pitt, advised George II to raise Highland regiments from the broken Jacobite clans, the Master of Lovett, son of the Old Fox, Penniless and Landless, formed the 7th Regiment, the Fraser Highlanders. against the French in Canada and played a key role in Wolfe's greatest victory, the capture of Quebec. It was a Fraser Highlander who found the way up the heights of Abraham. And Colonel Simon Fraser appears in Benjamin West's famous painting, The Death of Wolfe, standing in the center of a group of officers. There is a tradition, too, that Wolfe who as a young officer had refused to shoot a Fraser at Culloden, died in the arms of the Fraser. In 1850, the Inverness militia was formed and wore the Fraser tartan. Later, it became a battalion of the Cameron Highlanders. And another famous regiment, the Lovett Scouts, was formed in 1899 to fight in the Boer War. The Lovett Scouts went on to see service in the Great War, in Gallipoli, Egypt and Macedonia, and again in World War II. Afterwards, they continued as a territorial regiment. Duncan Fraser, 
and was one of the original Lovett Scouts. He pauses to gaze at the parting stone, where the Fraser women bid farewell to their menfolk going off to the war. Today, in the Fraser country, you will find the trappings of the 20th century. The deep-rooted skills of generations of warrior farmers are allied to modern methods. In the glorious countryside of the lands of Lovett, the battle is with nature. There are sheep on the hill, but in the highland clearances of the 19th century, no Fraser was ever moved off his land by his chief to make room for them. Nature is bountiful here. There are deer in the hill, birds in the heather, fish in the rivers. Makimi runs his estate with the skill of a man who is noted as a breeder and judge of livestock. During the Second World War, when his homeland and indeed the whole civilized world was threatened, he served in the Scots Guards and the Lovett Scouts. But his greatest fame was as an outstanding leader of the commandos he'd helped to raise and train. circle from the Seigneurie of Fraiselière, who had sailed from Normandy nine centuries before. <laughs> <laughs> 